Hi there, guys. Welcome back to Custer's 7th Cavalry in 7 minutes, maybe 17. Today we're going to talk about Captain Thomas Tucker French. You're probably familiar with Frederick Benteen. Maybe you've watched my videos. Maybe you know his story. He was very critical of everyone. And Benteen said, they, meaning all the officers on Reno Hill, were a pack of cowards. Captain French excluded. So let's find out what moved Benteen to that rare bit of praise. Thanks for joining me. Thomas Henry French was born in Baltimore on March 4th, 1843. He was the youngest of four children. He had three sisters, the poor guy. His family moved to Washington, D.C. when French was about 10, and his father was part owner of a bookstore. The French family was Catholic, and French attended Georgetown College from the ages of 10 to 14. Georgetown College is now known as Georgetown University. It was founded in 1789, was, and is today a Catholic school. French's tuition was paid for by his uncle, Colonel Martin Burke. In 1858, French's father died and he was adopted by Colonel Burke. French began working as a clerk while his uncle kept trying and failing to get him a nomination at the United States Military Academy at West Point. In January 1864, with the Civil War raging around him, the 20-year-old decided to enlist in the 10th U.S. Infantry. French at that time is described as being 5 feet 8 and a half inches tall with brown hair and hazel eyes. Colonel Burke continued to lobby for a commission for his nephew. This time, he had more luck, and just a couple months after enlisting, Thomas French passed the examining boards and became a second lieutenant. He excelled and was promoted quickly through the ranks. He was breveted to captain, and at the Battle of Chapel House, he was badly wounded in the left leg. After the war, when the army downsized, French remained an officer of excellent standing. He transferred to the cavalry, and in 1871, Captain Thomas French joined the 7th Cav at Fort Hayes, Kansas. French was assigned to M Company, where he would spend the rest of his military career. He was in the South during Reconstruction duty, or doing Reconstruction duty, until the 7th was transferred to the Dakotas in the spring of 1873. During that summer's Yellowstone expedition, he had his first engagement with the Lakota. He commanded one of the 7th's two battalions in the August 11th fight near the mouth of the Bighorn River. U.S. troops were outnumbered two to one. Custer mentions French's actions in his official report, including French's ability to shoot a warrior in the distance out of his saddle. The following year, French accompanied the 7th on the Black Hills expedition. French was known as a good shot, healthy and active. He was a close friend of William Weiner Cook, and according to French himself, he, Cook, and Custer were the three best shots in the regiment. French also may have been well read. Benteen writes in a letter to his wife and mentioning that French gave him a copy of the Renaissance playwright Ben Jonson's collected works. At the time of the Little Bighorn, French was getting maybe a little soft around the middle. Supposedly, the enlisted men called him Tucker, and one of them claimed he was, quote, a fat man with a falsetto voice, but pictures don't really show him being too terribly out of shape. This brings us to the fateful day of June 25th, 1876. In brief, Custer divided his command, sending Benteen and three companies on a scout to the left. After riding with Reno for a few miles and seeing fleeing warriors in the distance, Custer sent Reno with three companies, as well as the Indian scouts, to charge down the valley and bring the Cheyenne and Sioux warriors to battle. The three companies with Reno were M Company. Captain French was the company commander. His first lieutenant was Edward Mathy, who was in charge of the pack train that day. His second lieutenant was James Sturgis, but Sturgis had been detached to serve with E Company. French's first sergeant, though, was John Ryan, who was a seasoned veteran of many conflicts. A Company was led by Captain Miles Moylan with First Lieutenant Carlos DeRudio. Remember DeRudio, he comes up again. And Second Lieutenant Charles Varnum, who was the acting chief of scouts. G Company commander was First Lieutenant Donald McIntosh. The Second Lieutenant was George Wallace, who was the acting engineer that day and was supposed to be with Custer but Custer let Wallace ride with his friend Varnum, which saved Wallace's life. 
You can see on this excellent map by Jeff Lackey how the three companies rode down the valley. They stayed fairly close to the river as they approached, using the timber as a screen. When they reached it, they dismounted. Here's another view. M Company, French's company, of course, was the first to arrive, and they were sent to secure the area of greatest concern, the west flank. A Company then followed to secure M's right, and G Company, being last, was split, some entering the timber, the rest closing the line with A. So French is the first officer deployed. He has the best view of what's happening, including a view of the Indians on the western bluffs. Sergeant Charles White of M Company said that French was the only officer who properly deployed his part of the skirmish line. This is Corporal Hobart Ryder's description. I rode in ahead of the company with Major Reno. After we got very near a bunch of woods, I fell in with the company. Captain French was in command. Captain French gave orders for myself and some of the others of the company to move ahead to these woods. We done so and remained there until the company came up. The order was given to dismount then. Captain French ordered the company to deploy as skirmishers. We did so. Captain French stood within a very few feet of me. I seen him kill one Indian, as I supposed, and wound another. When Sergeant Miles O'Hara was shot in the skirmish line, the men started falling back into the wooded area or timber. And it was in the timber that another soldier of M Company was shot, Private George Lorenz, and many point to this as the catalyst of Major Reno's retreat. Private William Morris recalled, one of our men came up from the timber and reported they were killing our horses in the rear. Major Reno then made his only error and gave the command, retreat to your horses, men. French immediately corrected the mistake with the command, steady men fall back slowly, face the enemy and continue your fire. The troops fell back slowly and in perfect order and held the Indians in check until A and G had mounted. Here's more from Corporal Ryder. One of our company was killed, Private Lorenz. Captain French requested several of our men to try and bring him along. Captain French was in the rear of our company with a drawn pistol, and I did not see him ahead of the company until our arrival on the hill. I seen him after we were halfway up the hill, firing at the Indians after the companies passed him. Sergeant White said, The captain waited until all his men got out of the timber, then followed up in the rear. He drew his revolver and firing at the Indians as they were riding alongside him some 20 yards on either side. The captain had barely a chance to get to the ford. The Indians were so thick you could hardly see what was going on until the captain got on the other side of the river. He then dismounted from his horse, took his rifle, and fired on the Indians standing on the river bank. I saw he killed two there. Once Major Reno's column reached the bluffs, they were joined by Benteen and Benteen's three companies. After the ammunition packs and then the entire pack train came up, Reno and Benteen's columns moved in the direction of Custer. Captain Thomas Weir and his D Company led the way. Barry C. Johnson's biography of Thomas French, a captain of chivalric courage, points out, M Company was the only company which fought in the valley and also went out to Weir Point. As it is most unlikely that he received any orders, French deserves great credit for joining Benteen's entirely unscathed companies and for taking an advanced position. When the, Indian, when the Indians started for Weir Point, the companies fell back to Reno Benteen Hill. Of the later siege, soldier Roman Rutten said, Benteen came over and told how rapidly he was losing his men and that if he did not get assistance soon, he could not hold his hill. He quietly remarked that if his hill was carried by Indians, the remaining six companies would not last long. Benteen discussed the matter with Reno, who said, finally, he might take one of the companies on that side. And Benteen, without discussing which one he was to have, said, all right, I will take French. French was informed about this and immediately went along the line and told his men to be still but ready when he would give the word to jump up and run for Benteen's line. Benteen's line, being on the highest ground in the vicinity, the men going to his assistance would be clearly exposed for some 100 yards while going up that slope. At French's word, all the men present leapt to their feet, scattered and started up the hill. After joining Benteen, French had some difficulty keeping his men together. Private Moore said, When the Sioux charged our line, I saw the captain shoot one Indian himself, and the new recruits started to run, some few of them, and the captain called them back, saying, 
I want every man to stand. The first man that runs, I'll shoot him. And they all came back. At one stage, a bullet passed through French's hat and French said, boys, that's a pretty close shave. I guess it's about time I should make a move. Later, on June 28th, while burying their friends on the battlefield, Major Reno remembered, the stench was sickening. Captain French came to me and said, have you got any whiskey? And I answered that I had a little, and he said, give me a drink for I'm sick at the stomach, and I did so. In May to November 1877, under Nelson Miles, the 7th horse is back in the field still after the Sioux. In mid-August 1877, they chased Chief Joseph and his Nez Perce. In that fight, French was cited by Captain Benteen for conspicuous gallantry in two charges. However, in that same summer of 1877, French is starting to fall apart. Benteen writes his wife, French was quite ill, as usual after drunks, and hasn't gotten off his toot as yet. He'll get dropped the first thing he knows. Benteen also wrote, I believe French expects to marry in the autumn. He was in arrest for being drunk a few days ago. Unfortunately, no one knows who the prospective bride was, and sadly, French never did marry. By 1878, his heavy drinking continues. In late August, he suffers an accident while accompanying surveyors through unknown country, and when his horse is spooked and nearly trampled him, knocking him down, striking him in the head. French said he was almost fatally hurt. One of his soldiers said French was severely cut on the side of his head. It was less than a week after this accident that French made the tragic first impression upon Major Henry Lizelle, the post commander at Fort Rulin in the Black Hills. Camp Rulin was the predecessor of Fort Meade. Major Lizelle thought French was drunk. French said he was sick. That wasn't the only time French's behavior was suspicious in the fall of 1878. Another French seemed intoxicated when he reported to duty. French appealed for mercy and Major Lazelle gave him four days leave. But while French was on this leave, Lieutenant Carlos de Rudio and his wife made an official complaint against him. That was the straw that broke French's back. Other instances of French misbehaving were compiled and a trial was ordered. It was because of his own court-martial that Thomas French was not able to testify at the Reno Court of Inquiry, which took place at the same time. The New York Times printed an article in January 1879 that said, Captain French of the 7th Cavalry, who is credited with great bravery at the Battle of the Little Bighorn, stated today that he saw nothing of Major Reno on the evening of June 25th until noon of June 26th. Reno was out of sight, and he, French, could not find anyone who did see him. Over the course of French's own court-martial, there were charges of various degrees, from his being drunk on duty, to leaving his quarters when he was under arrest, to go to the trader shop, to buy canned food, to riding in an ambulance and drinking with a laundress, Mrs. Egan. Mrs. Egan was the wife of an enlisted man. French stated he was not intoxicated, but either ill or suffering from his old leg injury. The defense also poked holes in the claims that French had been cavorting and drinking with a laundress, as the witness who said this was viewed as unreliable, and Mrs. DeRudio, who testified in writing, revealed her accusations had been based on hearsay. However, there were two days that French was so sick he could not even attend his own court-martial, and the post-surgeon said he was suffering from a nervous depression produced by a too-continued use of stimulants. French was found not guilty of cavorting with a laundress. However, he was found guilty of drunkenness on duty or conduct unbecoming an officer. French submitted a pledge of abstinence to the court, but it didn't save him. He was suspended from duty, but ordered to remain at Fort Meade. His requests for leave to visit home were denied. This must have been a terrible limbo. A military life is one of constant routine, punctuated by bugle calls and drills, every moment regimented, and suddenly French was unable to participate in what had defined him for more than 15 years. It's no wonder that less than a year later, he is described as being physically and mentally a mere wreck. French retired from the army on February 5th, 1880. On February 20th, the house he owned in Bismarck was burned down. The authorities suspected it as arson. It was during this dark time that Thomas French carried on a correspondence with the mother of his good friend, William Weiner Cook, who had died with Custer at the Little Bighorn. 
French has a lot to say about Major Reno in his letters to Mrs. Cook. I'm afraid the many reports you have heard regarding Reno's conduct on the 25th are bona fide. Your son and our dear friends died, may I say, were murdered by that cur's hand as surely as I commit these lines. He also wrote, I hate to leave active service as I would like one more chance at those Sioux. I want revenge for my friends. In another letter, he tells her how he attempted to defend the retreat. If one man can hold back seven or eight hundred, what might not 120 have done at the right instant? Sometimes one minute is as far more value than years afterwards or before, and military life consists simply in waiting for opportunities. French insinuates he should have shot Reno. If Major Reno had been killed or injured, French would have been the next ranking officer in Reno's column in the timber fight, and he thought he could have changed the outcome. He wrote, It's not nice, I know, to mention these things, but they do not rest on my own version. What I mean to get at is this. If I were able to do all this single-handed, what might I not have done with a coveted opportunity? But a friendly bullet did not come to assist me, and although the idea flashed through my mind, yet I did not dare resort to murder. The latter, I now believe, would have been justifiable. French also told Mrs. Cook he had contemplated suicide. I do from the bottom of my heart sympathize with you in your great affliction, a sorrow which so affected a powerful, burly brute like me who lost no blood relation so that I was driven to attempted suicide must have been for you a cross. French had been staying at a hotel near Fort Leavenworth, the Planters Hotel, and that's where his body was found on March 27, 1882. The cause of death was apoplexy. He was only 39 years old. He was buried at Fort Leavenworth with military honors, but 10 years later, he was reburied next to his family members at Holy Rood Catholic Cemetery in Georgetown, Washington, D.C. As my friend Jeff Lackey pointed out, we spent a lot of time talking about the bravery of Captain Benteen at the Battle of the Little Bighorn, while Captain Thomas French is too often a footnote. So I thought I'd leave you with this very vivid description by the artist and Little Bighorn scholar George Cush. Quote, Tom French and William Weiner Cook were close friends and allies in the Seventh Horse. They were good-natured and prided themselves on just about everything, particularly their horsemanship. They gloried in their riding prowess and rode mounts that no one else could. French was a true hero of the Little Bighorn. He was dressed in a full suit of fringed buckskin. He was a crack shot, and there was not an ounce of fear in his body. Thanks guys, uh, please subscribe, click your notification button and watch my other videos. As I mentioned, it's kind of hard to find information about Captain Thomas French. His exploits are too often overlooked. So I had a lot of help from my friends in particular with this video. Thank you so much to Jeff Lackey for those incredible maps of the Reno Valley fight. Thank you to Nathan for sharing information about French's court-martial and to Dale for sharing the Barry Johnson article about French's life, a chivalric captain. I recommend you all try and find that and read it. And I want to especially thank George Cush for letting me use images of Mrs. Cook and also sharing just incredible excerpts of French's letters to Mrs. Cook. He has a wonderful collection and he's been very good to me. So yeah, thanks guys. I hope to see you again soon. Bye.